Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about the animal side of human nature with Dr. Karen Bondar, a biologist with a twist. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki, recorded on Thursday, September 2nd, 2010. Oh, the humanity. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki, and this is the hour where we get to talk about science. And are you ready? It's time to get down, time to get dirty. In the world of humanity, who are we? We do some weird things as people, right? Yeah, we do some pretty odd things. We have strange behaviors. A lot of people think a lot of the things that we do kind of separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom, keep us, keep us apart somehow. But is that really true? Are we really all that different from the other animals in the animal kingdom? Or, um, you know, should we talk about this? Should we get into this question? So here today to talk about that question, I have Dr. Karen Bondar, and she is a biologist with a PhD in ecology and a BS in specializing in marine biology. She also holds a master's degree in education and development of snails. And she spent one year as a full-time ballerina in Frankfurt, Germany, before jumping into her scientific study. And her recent book, this one right here, her recent book asks the question, what is the nature of human nature? Is there nature in human nature? And I think that really is the, the crux of the question there. So uh, Dr. Bondar, is there nature in human nature? <laughs> I think, well, there's definitely a couple of ways of looking at that question. And yes, overall, I think there absolutely is nature in human nature, although we, we as humans tend to put a lot of complicated layers over what we could term natural or biological behavior. So yes, of course, we were created by the processes of evolution just like every, every other organism was. Um, so I guess we have to say that we are part of nature. But as far as the rules of biology, survive, reproduce, we do a lot of extra things, a lot of extra things. We spend a lot of time doing things that are pretty non-biological. And uh, that's what I focus on in the book. I find it clearly fascinating that humans are sort of veering on the, uh, on a different trajectory than many other animals. Yeah. What, what actually spurred you to write on this particular topic? It is always interesting to ask questions about ourselves, but you know, to really delve into it and write a book about it, like what, what got you going? Yeah, well, I guess uh, way back when in undergrad, um, I took a course on the evolution of social behavior. And one of the first things we were asked to do as part of that course was to think about things that humans do that no other animals do. And so a lot of the, uh, the participants in the class came back with, with things that we thought were uniquely human. And one by one, turns out we went around the classroom naming things uh most things could be could be discounted or, or people could think of examples where animals actually did do some of the some of the crazy strange things that uh that we had brought up so that question i guess that was way back when but that question has always sort of stayed at the forefront of my mind as something that's really interesting and 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 i like to think about whether or not humans are unique in, in the behaviors that we do, or whether when you sort of strip away the complex layers of, uh, of human rituals that we put on top of things, whether these behaviors are simply enabling us to survive and reproduce. Um, so one gets caught up in 
the uh, depths of grad school uh, and grad school can become pretty all encompassing. So it wasn't until I was taking a break from grad school or until I had finished uh, my PhD that I was at home and uh, I have three kids, so I have been on maternity leave for a little while. And I was actually able to sit down and really start thinking about things that I like, uh, which mm -hmm. sometimes doesn't actually happen in grad school. We kind of get caught up in thinking about things that we have to think about and things, little details about things that are necessary in order to complete the next step of our degree. So, yeah, it's been a great holiday, if you will, uh, <laughs> a chance to sit down and look at what I love to do and what I to think about. And that's that's how the book started. I just simply wanted to think. I wanted to write and I wanted to read. And, and a year later, the book, it, it pretty much wrote itself. It was in me to write, I keep saying, because it it's really was. So let's get into some of those interesting, um, some of those really interesting behaviors that, that people do. So mm -hmm. when you started looking into topics and going, okay, how am I going to organize this book? There's so many behaviors. Um, I was looking through it and the two main parts are survival and reproduction. I mean, this indeed. is pretty much yeah. straight up, <laughs> you know, biology. Bio 101, indeed. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that's, as I sort of wrote, initially it was very unorganized. It was just sort of topics all over the place. And, uh, but yeah, as I sort of, came to a framework for the book, it became really clear that as ecologists and as biologists, we classify organisms according to uh, this, this mantra of survival and reproduction. And of course, when Charles Darwin coined the term survival of the fittest, um, in that term, there is not only a survival component, of course, but there's a reproductive component because your biological fitness is defined as, uh, as how well you will be able to represent your genes in future generations. So. Pretty much everything can be classified as contributing to one or the other. Uh, so, so I basically started to organize the topics into the chapters based on either surviving or reproducing. And uh, so the first topic that came up with respect to survival is, of course, eating. Everybody's got to eat. Everybody has to find enough food. Everybody has to either kill it or detoxify it or uh, find it. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, for humans in the Western world, this is extremely easy. Um, however, we, despite the, the facility with which we can obtain food and, and nutrition, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways that we simply don't. And so that's kind of where some of the first topics came into, especially the, uh, the very first topic in the book, which is why humans need a food pyramid. We seem to be the only animal that requires um, a diagram to tell us how much of, of certain proportions of things to include in our diet. Other organisms don't need that. Yeah, and it, it's really interesting to me that the um that we we need this food pyramid and it, but food is this central part of of our social activities of being human. I mean, it's so integral to so much of what we do yet at the same time, can you remind me again how many how many servings <laughs> am I supposed to eat? I mean, it's just a little <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And also, as far as nutritional deficiencies go, uh, some of the organisms that I talk about in the book are able to um, not only elucidate what their nutritional deficiencies are, but they're able to actively uh, make up for any deficiencies. And so scientists took little things like cockroaches, web building spiders, uh, pred predatory spiders. So yeah, there's a cartoon one. And uh, they took these organisms and subjected them to various diets that were severely depleted in either protein or carbohydrates. And, and then experimentally, when these organisms were reintroduced to a choice of any kind of food that they wanted to have, they, without a doubt, without, without any hesitation, uh, reestablished a correct balance of nutrients within their own bodies. And uh, so for humans, a lot of times we may be deficient in one nutrient and in, in something that, that could be causing severe problems to our health. We, although we don't seem to possess the capability to uh, figure out what that is, uh, much less go about changing our diet in order to correct it. Yeah, there are, um, you know, reported cases like pica, um, eating dirt or, mm -hmm. um, you know, licking walls, licking paint on walls. There are reported cases of, of people doing this and it seems to be nutritionally motivated. But at the same time, it's, it, 
that's on the extreme ends of things. And it's, uh, there are, you know, it's just extreme cases where this takes place. It's not like on an everyday scale, you're going to go, oh, I'm a little deficient in iron today. <laughs> I need to have yeah. more spinach. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. It's sort of the, the fine tuning that animals are able to attain and, and not all animals, but at least some examples uh, and the invertebrates are the ones that I talk about in this regard. Uh, the fine tuning that they're able to exhibit is, is quite amazing. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, the where it seems that we go wrong is in kind of our ability to to make decisions when fat and sugar are involved. So Indeed. it just seems like, you know, we're going to at every turn, I mean, most people if they're given the choice between like a candy bar or something fatty and rich and energy dense, we're going to go to that as opposed to the nice healthy salad with all sorts of vegetables in it. I mean, is there, Indeed. did you, did you run across any, um, experimental evidence that suggests why that might be possible while you were researching? Uh, well, actually, that's a good question. I didn't actually research it as much from the human uh, side. The, a lot of the human observations I make are based on things that I experience. And so uh, I, I approach it largely from the organismal standpoint. But you're absolutely right about the fact that humans will and do <laughs> choose the 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 foodstuffs that are the tastiest, although tastiest, I suppose, can be defined in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, the junk food chapter uh, is devoted to uh, the fact that we, of course, as humans in the Western world, are addicted to junk food, uh, despite the fact that this kind of nutrition, if you can even call it that, um, is not contributing positively to our survival capabilities or to our reproductive output. Uh, when you think about it, it's doing just the opposite. Uh, and there's actually a situation that's occurring in uh, the northern oceans um, that the fish communities are actually being restructured and it's not exactly uh, determined why this is happening, although climate change seems to be one of the major reasons for it. A lot of the fish species have uh, completely restructured in terms of their being, uh, there used to be very high fat species, uh, Pacific herring and so on, and now there's very low fat species like walleye pollock. And this is being blamed for uh, the, the decline of large mammal populations, sea lion and, and uh, seal populations in the Northern Oceans. And this is actually called the junk food hypothesis. And these guys, they can find the junk food more easily. So it's easier for them to get junk food because the junk food is what is there. For us, I suppose the same argument can be made. It's easy to find junk food, the junk food is there, but the good stuff is there too. So <laughs> that's, that's a little bit of a conundrum. Yeah, and it comes down to self-control in our, in our particular situation. Um, I, I think that the, the far-reaching con consequences of what you're talking about with uh, respect to large sea mammals is really interesting because once you start seeing fewer fatty fishes for the sea mammals to eat, then there are fewer sea mammals. And then the sharks that feed upon the sea mammals are also going to find, um, are going to have a harder time finding their food as well. So it just, it starts yeah. piling up. It starts coming right down. When you have a yeah. major predator, uh, you know, someone who is near the top of the food chain or at the top of the food chain that can't find enough to eat, uh, that's, that's going to be a very dangerous situation and that's potentially going to cause the collapse of a lot of these uh, freshwater food chains. Um, experimental work has actually been done uh, here close to where I live in Vancouver at the Vancouver Aquarium that shows that juvenile uh, sea lions simply cannot obtain all of the nutrition that they need by eating this junk food, this walleye pollock. Even if they eat it continuously, it still doesn't provide them enough uh, nutrition and energy for them to 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 swim as they should in their, you know, they're very high, high energy species. So yeah, right. it's a, it's a tough problem and it's all just due to this restructuring of the community yeah. and to them eating junk food. So. Right. And it's not just, so we talk about humans not being able to make the right choices, whereas say cockroaches are really good at making food choices. Oh, long Indeed. live the con cockroach. <laughs> I know. I love cockroaches and I, the cockroaches have a bad rap and they come up a lot in the book. And I, I'm, an, I'm a fan of the spineless. I always have been. I, most of the research, well, all the research that I've done for my master's and my PhD was all uh, on uh, invertebrates. Love them. But, the, you know, it's funny. The invertebrates come up time and time again as having 
elegant, simple ways to solve everyday problems. And of course, for humans, we have this ginormous brain and these uh, very complicated ways that we go about doing things. And I think sometimes our brain is our absolute downfall. We, we neglect to observe the spectacular simplicity that uh, it's, so, it's so easy to eat healthy. We just simply don't. <laughs> right. And and we don't, cockroaches do, but neither do primates. So it's, it's, not, it's not just us, but also other primate species. And does it go, does it go down to the, the seals and sea lions and those large mammals when they're not, you know, when they're eating the wall-eyed pollock and not getting all their nutrition? Do they go in search of what they need? Or do they have, are their brains complicated enough that they fall into the same problem that we do? Yeah, good question. I... I think, I, you know, I'm not sure, and I don't know that the research has actually even been done as far as those kinds of choice experiments. But I think that if those, if the high quality food choices were available, I think that they, my thought would be that they would absolutely be consumed first and foremost. Um, for the for the seals and sea lions, it's just simply that they are no longer available. So let's move from just talking about the food that these, anim- that, that, <laughs> that these animals, us humans, eat um, into the idea of um, staying healthy. And mm-hmm. what, what, so the what next, do we do? Yeah, we do. We're very lucky. We're, it's very easy to stay, to stay relatively healthy uh, for us. We've got lots of ways to keep our homes safe and, uh, and free of germs. We've got inoculations. We've got medical clinics. We've got a lot of things that uh, when you stop and think about, these things are not available in the animal kingdom. Although, as such, they're not available, but they are when you get right into it. And so something like a medical clinic, in my book, I uh, liken that to a cleaning station on a coral reef. So in tropical coral reefs, there are tiny little cleaning rafts, little uh, fish that remove ectoparasites from a variety of organisms, including large reef fish. Uh, They also clean wounds. So if fish have come in contact with... um, with sharp corals or with sea urchins, which is a very common occurrence in the coral reef, uh, these fish will actually re- remove necrotic tissue and help to clean wounds. And so uh, a researcher in uh, Queensland, Dr. Lexa Gruder, who I, um, yeah, who's a good, who's a good friend, uh, she actually looks at a lot of these interactions and she has found that rates of infection or rates of death by infection of either uh, parasites or of wounds uh, is actually very low because these fish are able to clean themselves up due to the fact that they have these little medical clinics to go to. Uh, So that's one example. Um, There are a lot of organisms that use all sorts of aromatic compounds or healing compounds and salves that that actually, you know, lend a lot of credence to naturopathic medicine. Um, for example, the, the powers of aromatherapy uh, are alive and well in bird nests in order to help uh, nestlings survive against uh, tick infections or mosquitoes and uh, things like yarrow and other things that are very aromatic are extremely helpful to these organisms to, to help keep their nests clean and free of infection. Um, another cool example of something that animals can do when they are not healthy in one area is simply move to another area. And uh, I talk about uh, an example of a family that uh, was in the news quite a bit here in British Columbia. They moved from very, very sunny Cape Town in South Africa to Prince Rupert, British Columbia, which rains over 11 months of the year. It's extremely gray. Uh, But this family moved all the way from Cape Town. And it was because three of the four members of the family had a severe allergy to the sunlight. And so to cure what ailed them, they just simply moved to the place that that worked best for them. So uh, salmon, who are often heavily infected with uh, sea lice, can remedy that situation by returning from the salt water to the fresh water. And in doing so, the sea lice have a very much uh, tr- a truncated life span in the fresh water. And so what they do is they come in a little bit early. And of course, there's there's costs to doing that too. They can't grow as large, so their fecundity is, is decreased, but you can't have babies in your bed. So they end up coming to the fresh water to get rid of the major lice infection. And that's something they can do. So to them, uh, means being able to survive long enough to reproduce if they are heavily infested with sea lice. <laughs> so in the, in the human case of things, um, what do we end up 
you know, we can move to someplace else. How many animals can actually move to a different location, though? I mean, salmon are pretty special in their ability to be able to go fresh water to seawater and, and move from place to place. And they're, they're, you know, not all species of fish are able to do that. So is it these they, larger, yeah. maybe more mobile animals that are able to just go, okay, no more sun. I need, I need to get out of the sun or I need to get rid of these, these sea lice. Let's go to fresh water. I need <laughs> a vacation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. I, I think that that's a specialized case again uh, of an organism uh, that because of the way that their life history strategy uh, is, they they live both in salt water and fresh water, and they have the ability to move great distances. This is something that's that's simply going to work for them. It wouldn't work for all organisms, and certainly not for fish that are not anadromous or um, organisms that can't drastically change. I mean, most organisms that live in a uh, in a terrestrial habitat can't probably change that habitat too drastically. And although organisms have been shown to do things like instead of uh, staying up in the day, perhaps staying up at night, if, you know, organisms tend to, to try to make it work, wh whatever is uh, available to them. Yeah, there's a, an interesting comment in the chat room here um, that unfortunately in New York, if you move out of New York, you're just going to take the bed bugs with you. Mm. So, <laughs> that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> so not, you won't necessarily, you know, it's not like the salmon and the sea lice. You're not necessarily going to get rid of those bed bugs just by well, moving What a good away. strategy for the bed bugs, you know, yeah. <laughs> the bed bugs were winning that evolutionary battle. <laughs> Yeah, the bed bugs definitely. They're they're definitely they've got they've got a leg up or six legs up. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. In terms of um of other health, um, you have this wonderful cartoon that I have to put up. Um losing weight, weight loss. I mean, this is in American culture at least, and it, I think it's becoming more prevalent around the world with um, more and more people eating fast food and um, more processed diets, but diabetes is a, a big factor, heart disease, all these things that are related to um, being overweight and being extremely overweight and maybe for long periods of time, this, this can have drastic effects on your survival, right? So weight loss is this huge cultural thing here. Um, huge. Do other, do animals go through, like I got a binge and purge kind of, <laughs> what's going it, on? You know what they do? Um, there's a lot of really interesting examples uh, of, of this kind of behavior. Um, although I have to say most of the time, these kind of behaviors, tend to make animals seem extremely, extremely good and humans extremely, extremely pathetic. Uh, as far as being able to control and to manipulate um, their bodies and uh, make them functional for uh, the tasks that they have to do. A couple of examples here, uh, migrating birds. So there are several species of birds that go on extreme migrations, in some cases up to nine or 10,000 kilometers at a time. These birds, uh, bar-tailed godwits, they're called, um, they're actually able to manipulate their body tissues. So they binge, as you said, uh, they bulk up, they get, they store a huge abdominal fat store, they've got muscles, they, they hypertrophy their entire digestive system in order to bulk up for these long distance migrations. Um, and then what they do is they're able to completely reverse it after they after they go on these long trips in order to then become uh, more ready for their other aspects of their lives once their migration is completed. Other bird species um, outside of those that are in a migratory rule, when they have a new nest of babies to care for, they lose weight in order to provide their young with more food. And the reason that they do this is a lot of seabirds often roost in colonies that are uh, quite isolated from where their food is. They'll be on uh, cliff sides or other areas. They, the parents actually have to fly for pretty long distances in order to find either the fish food or any other um, rodent food that the babies need to eat. So of course, you can imagine, it's going to cost these parents a lot more in terms of their energy. If they're packing around a few extra pounds, uh, it's going to be a lot harder for them to provision their young. So what they do, and this is actually called the programmed anorexia hypothesis, they simply lose the weight. They just simply do. They stop eating. They just stop eating. And it goes off and they lose weight. 
Yep. And then they are able to, in some cases, up to a 30% decrease in the energy required to go and provision their young. Uh, so it's a big deal. They, they are able to manipulate their body weight according to the functions that they need to provide in order to survive and reproduce. And I think, again, that's where humans, we get it wrong big time. We don't, we don't uh, program our, uh, our bodies in order to be able to optimal, optimally survive and reproduce our body size and our uh, images and all those sort of things are programmed by things that have nothing to do with surviving or reproducing. It's, it's sort of more of an image-based thing, psychological response as opposed to a physical response. Right. Well, it seems, it seems like there's, um, you know, there's the psycho, psychosocial responses. So we have like these cultural um, body types that, you know, this is what you're supposed to look like. And nowadays there's this huge question of, you know, how, um, how the manipulation of images in the media are um, really leading to shifting, you know, our, our, uh, the image, the search image that we're looking for, that ideal, ideal mate. Who is that supposed to be? And um, how is our this? How are the social cues coming in to kind of overpower the, I guess, innate psychological yeah. stuff? Because you know, a lot of cases. I mean, in most animals in the animal kingdom, fat on the body is a good thing. It's right. it's not like fat is bad. It's something that insulates you during the winter. It provides extra energy for you should you need it. And so, yeah, I think humans that have come up with this idea of you know, of course, these images we see all the time in the media. That's something that's that's actually just completely wrong, biologically speaking. <laughs> yeah, there's it, it. Really is when you look at when you look at what's happening from. A biological perspective and you you sit down and you go okay humans mm-hmm, what, mm-hmm. You, what you doing here <laughs> totally just, and it's true you, I, what, I are, what are we doing <laughs> There's a lot of great examples in it. That's, I think that's the part of the fun of the book too, is a lot of the time it's like, are you kidding me? Is this, you know, how, how can humans consider ourselves to be so, so much higher and mightier than all the rest? Because we do some pretty silly things. <laughs> do you get in, in the book, do you get into um, dating at all? I mean, oh, you move from yes. <laughs> the basic, basic survival, eating, health, those kinds of things. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you move into... Reproduction and then it starts to, to be reproduce. about the sex, indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, and this is the fun part. I mean, well, of course, there's so much great information as far as surviving with food, surviving with your home, surviving with medical care. But let's face it, when we want to talk about the fun stuff, we talk about sex and all of the ridiculous rituals that we go about uh, in order to find a mate, in order to court that mate, and eventually procreate with that mate and then successfully raise children. Uh, so, yes. The, there are so many wonderful things to talk about when we talk about finding, uh, looking for that special someone. Um, there are a plethora of strategies by which females in the animal kingdom find their mates, uh, of course, uh, uh, males too. And uh, so we start by things simple as, uh, have you had work done? <laughs> in humans, here's another <laughs> one of these areas where, you know, um, we, we do things, we do beauty interventions all the time, whether it's having a little bit of makeup on, whether it's getting your hair done or colored, whether it's doing something drastic like having surgery, we do a lot of work. And so one has to answer, ask the question, uh, is that synonymous with somebody who has good genes to offer the next generation? Because as this cartoon kind of pokes fun at, in the animal kingdom, an organism that is highly adorned, that is beautiful, that has a lot to offer as far as its physical beauty, often, and of course most of the time, has also a really good set of genes to offer. A healthy and uh, biologically fit organism is an organism that looks good. However, for the humans, you can't necessarily always say that because a human that looks good can have a lot of, had a lot of work done. And so we start confusing ourselves right away. It's this big brain thing that, uh, that goes on. So we have that kind of an issue. And then, um, gosh, what is, what else did I, did I bring up with you as far as the dating goes? There's, there's just so many ways, uh, females, females can also test out a potential mate by trying to, uh, take some of his food. 
Now, I don't know if, if you've ever been on a first date with a guy and you've grabbed a handful of his fries or a bite of his dinner, but, uh, you know, we may have a strategy uh, when we're doing something like this, and it's not because we want to taste the food. It's really got nothing to do with the food. It's got a lot to do with uh, how the man reacts when we do this. And so, yes, there we go. Uh, female orangutans will actually grab some food of a potential male partner not like I said not because she's hungry uh, and not because this food is particularly difficult to get uh, researchers that study this phenomenon have actually found that the types of food that that she'll steal from him are food stuffs that are available everywhere uh, they're very commonly available it's not about that it's about whether he's willing to share because the fact that males in these species are extremely aggressive and um, can actually physically hurt a female quite quite drastically during sexual intercourse or during the courting phase. She's developed this way to, to sort of test his temperament, if you will. So if he's willing to share a little bit with her, that shows her a good deal about whether he's willing to share uh, in parental care and whether he will be uh, someone with whom she would like to procreate. So this is a, an example of how other primates, and this is a very food sharing, food sharing without any kind of um, immediate response is actually very rare in the animal kingdom. Uh, humans do it and these other primates do it, but that, other than that, it's, it's very, very rare. Food sharing like that doesn't generally occur. I think that's so fascinating. The idea of um, you know, using food sharing as a cue to whether or not they're going to be a providing partner, whether or not that's going to be a, a good relationship to get into. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And I mean, human females have it lucky. We're very, you know, we're lucky to be able to have partners potentially that it doesn't, it doesn't cost us much to have sex. So a lot of females in the animal kingdom are not so lucky as well as right. we come to that. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the, where it gets into females being the choosy sex and, and having a, being choosy because there is a high cost associated with that. Um, in terms of um, the food sharing, I mean, I guess there's, there are da dating tactics. I mean, I, doing, having done bird research myself, it's um, in the bird kingdom, there are so many courting rituals that involve, mm -hmm. you know, the bower birds building a bower for the female, you know, the tower of feathers and ribbons and whatever they find out of blue bits of, of whatever that's, and who builds the most beautiful bower wins the girl, you know, and then, yeah. um, other Love examples of, of male birds trying to uh, bring, woo the female with bits of food or, um, you know, bringing them food and saying, look, I can give this to you. And then the female deciding whether or not that's going to work out. Um, so many other species though it's the after the fact you f you 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 choose the male and then then you you procreate and then if the male's involved in the rearing you just hope that the male's going to be good at providing <laughs> and finding food for the young indeed and there are so many great examples a bird is one that i just love because the bachelor pet who doesn't absolutely hate and shudder at the idea of the male human bachelor pad um that's you know just full of beer and, and it's dirty and it smells and it, you don't want to sit on the couches because you don't know what's in there. Um, and then you look at these power birds who are doing whatever they can to create these amazing environments for their potential female mates. And so that's something that I talk about in the book and it's, it's great, but then at the same time, you have to take a step back because uh, a non-resource based polygyny is the uh, mating system of the power birds. And basically what that means is the male gives you nothing but the seed. And so he's he's getting you there to woo you. And once he's got you, that's all he needs. And that's all he wants. Not a cuddle, not a thing. Out you go, girl. And um, <laughs> so unfortunately, that's so not what human females necessarily want, is it? No, we want the uh, we want the seeds and we want the package that the seeds came in. So um, we, we're different in that way, but it's it's a fun comparison to make for sure. Yeah, someone in the in the chat room just brought up, um, and I don't know whether you cover this in the book or not. The uh, the idea the females tend to be more touchy and to touch males a lot more, mm -hmm. and especially in or maybe early in the dating process. And does this touching have something to do similarly to the food sharing? Yeah, you know, I would absolutely liken that to the food sharing for sure. I think it's uh, perhaps by without even thinking about it, perhaps that's our way of 
getting a feel for him. How is he reacting when we touch his arm? Is he kind of, ooh, is he giving you one of those? Or is he, you know, is he into it? I absolutely agree. I think that the person in the chat room's got that right on, for sure. So once you go on a date, once you've you've got the got the dating, <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you've decided, I like this, I like this, this individual. We found each other. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. <laughs> it's uh, it's not easy to be a girl in the animal kingdom in a lot of ways. Um, we've got things like chastity belts. We've got things like prostitution. We've got all of these. Uh, not tonight, honey. I have a headache. So where to begin? Uh, first of all. Like you said before, females are generally the choosy sex. And that's, you know, it's a fairly broadly applicable statement across the entire animal kingdom and humans included. So for females, it's more about choosing an appropriate male. Whereas for males, it's more about choosing any female that's willing to look his way. Yeah, it's 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 not always the case, but you know, generally speaking, we can we can talk about things like that. So in a lot of invertebrate species, and in a lot of species altogether, there are many uh, males that mate with uh, one female. And so if you, if you look, for example, at something like a water strider, uh, these are the insects, of course, that you see bopping around on top of ponds and lakes and so on. These girls almost always have a headache. And uh, there's good reason for that. The, this, is a, this is a tough species to be a female in. And uh, the reason is one female can obtain as much sperm as she needs pretty much from one or two matings in her life. Now, this is terrible news for any male who hasn't had a chance to uh, mate with her yet. Uh, because, of course, males are wanting to contribute their sperm to the next generation. And if she's full, then... Uh, then that raises a conundrum for him. So what he will do is he will forcefully uh, have intercourse with her in order to, um, to to increase his chances. It doesn't matter if she needs it, wants it, he's going to do it. So there's, uh, through the course of behavioral evolution in this species, males and females have acquired very elaborate structures for him to be able to mount her and hold her so that he can do the job and for her to be able to actually get him off and to flick him off. So water striders are, represent uh, an organism that unfortunately has a tough time when it comes to reproduction. One thing that females can do, and a lot of females do this, is something called cryptic female choice. A lot of times, as I mentioned, there will be several males having sex with a female. She may not have wanted to have sex with all of them, but she can get the last laugh because she actually, in a lot of the cases, has mechanisms for selecting the sperm that she wants to uh, fertilize her eggs. So there's one uh, part of the book that is artificial insemination, and it's actually quite true. So even if she, uh, I don't know if anybody has ever seen ducks or other uh, yep. fowl, the, the example in the book is uh, actually, yeah, that's tough. That's not a fun thing to watch at all. No. And, and it is actually it is exactly what it is. It's it's like gang rape. And that's unfortunately what the reproductive strategy is for these organisms. However, reproductive, reproductively speaking, she gets the last laugh because she's actually uh, cryptically able to select the sperm that she wants to fertilize her eggs. Now, it's not always so bad. There are organisms that actually do have a really good time with it uh, and who have a lot of successful um, sexual relations, but they're not nearly, I suppose, as fun to talk about. So let's talk about the chastity belts before I forget, because this is a good one. So back <laughs> in the 15th century, the chastity belts, something that uh, humans invented, of course, way back when, and it was sort of composed of chains and very tough material. And it was essentially for females to wear when their partners were off at war so that they would be uh, faithful. They wouldn't uh, have sex with any other guys. So now mating plugs are something in the animal kingdom that's actually akin to a chastity belt. And again, this is a way uh, for a male to say, all right, I've left my mark here. I want to make sure that no other males are getting in here. So here's what I'm going to do. And a lot of males have sticky substances or hard substances that they actually plug up the female uh, and so that she can't reproduce anymore. Now, the cartoon is actually uh, with a white widow spiders who take this to the max. Now, of course, a lot of spider species are sexually cannibalistic, which means that the female will actually eat the male after 
uh, sex. Now, not always, but in these kinds of species, you can imagine that if he's got one shot at it, he better do something drastic in order to make sure that he fathers the next generation. So what he actually does in this species is he uh, plugs up the female's genital opening with his pedipalp, which is essentially the, the, the human equivalent of breaking off your penis inside of a, of a female's vagina and just leaving it there. And actually, experimentally, that's been shown to to, to actually significantly increase his chances of fathering the next generation. I mean, I guess if you're going to get eaten anyway, <laughs> just you like, might I'll, as leave, well. I'll just leave this behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to get that. eaten. I'm just going to, let's just leave this here. Just plug it up. Nobody <laughs> else is going to get in. And I'm off. <laughs> and I'm out. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. It's, you know, it, it, sex, is, sex and uh, I should say successful reproduction is, is quite a production in the animal kingdom. There's, there's just so many ways and so many problems, I guess, uh, although there's so many successes too. Yeah. And moving from the, to the success part of it, you know, hmm. we move... I, my, I myself am expecting a child in a few months. And so the actual... Oh, congratulations. Get, thank you. And so this part, this, this part of human nature and how it um, coincides and I guess agrees with a lot of what's going on in nature is very interesting to me right now just because of my personal situation. But, um, you know, pregnancy happens all over the animal kingdom. Um, <laughs> is there anything particularly Absolutely. special about the way we handle it? Yes, indeed. <laughs> and there's, this is, this is a chapter that was a lot of fun for me to write. And I wrote most of the book when I was pregnant with my third uh, child. And so, yeah, the, the first, one of the first sections in the, in the child rearing, which is the last chapter of the book is about um, how the world is nice to a pregnant lady. Somehow the world just seems to really appreciate you when you have, and, and isn't that true? I don't know if you're experiencing that already. Just people are open doors for you people are offering to carry things for you women let you pass them in the bathroom lineup and it's just people generally are a treat you really nice I'm, I'm and i don't know if that's forward to got that. some kind of a biological basis <laughs> are you okay yeah. you haven't popped yet <laughs> <laughs> um so well, when you do, trust me, it's it's good and milk that because then it gets tough. But <laughs> but um, so I started to wonder. Okay, do any other animals, you know, treat their pregnant ladies with with a little more respect? And and it turns out that they do. In in lizard species, um, that that they're grossly pregnant females actually get a really distinctive coloration. And um, some really detailed experiments were done with digital imaging that kind of looked at how uh, potential competitors potential, um, yeah, I guess competitors or other organisms with whom they may have clashed for resources or, or other things, they tended to actually be quite subdued in the presence of a grossly pregnant female. And so they tend to treat the females, both in this case uh, and in another case with primates that, um, that, were, that were significantly pregnant, they were giving her a break. And um, so in the book, I detail the, um, the experiments that were done, but it seems as though in some cases, and, and not all cases, because when you think about it, a lot of organisms, you can't really even tell um, that they are about to give birth if they are of a parasite species or, I mean, laying eggs is something completely different. So um, there are cases where in the animal kingdom, the uh, children or the, the childbearing mothers are treated very nicely. Um, now, of course, when those children come along, um, there's a whole new set of tasks to, to, uh, <laughs> to deal with, uh, such as breastfeeding is a huge one for us. And so this is uh, sort of where I head next in the book. And breastfeeding is something that takes up a huge amount of time, a huge amount of energy. Um, and, it's, and it's not that easy to do. Not all gals do it. Uh, but it's something that's ubiquitous in mammals, at least, and something that's kind of funny is that in some large mammals like sea lions, an aloe, a form of aloe nursing takes place. And what this means is that yeah. tiny baby juvenile sea lions, if their mother, for whatever reason, has been is out feeding or is unavailable, I mean, the world is a tough place. Maybe she's deceased. These little baby sea lions will go and actually nurse from another mom. 
And um, it, it's that's that's an example where I just you've got to really uh, be in awe of the animal kingdom that these tiny babies that have just been born have the actual ability to do this. I can't think of any of my little babies as being even remotely able to do anything uh, when they were first born. So um, now parenting in the animal kingdom, uh, there it is indeed, parenting in the animal kingdom takes on several forms and uh, oftentimes it's something that's extremely uh, cut and dry Picking a favorite, for example, I have three children, so I'm not allowed to pick a favorite. And uh, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily always mean that other in the animal kingdom don't do this. Um, in some bird species, for example, a really set of, a set of really elegant experiments was done on blue-footed boobies in the Galapagos. And of course, you know these birds because they have these gorgeous blue feet. And this is uh, a very, very uh, major sexual, sexually selected characteristic. The bluer, the better. And so females tend to select males based on the gorgeous blue feet that they have. Uh, so what researchers did is they uh, took males and females that had copulated. And what, what a female will generally do is lay one egg lay two eggs per partner. She'll lay one egg and then 48 hours, the second egg will come along. So uh, with the same partner. So this presented them a wonderful opportunity to see what would happen if they changed the quality of her mate in the middle of these two eggs being when they painted the feet of that male to a dull gray color, the second egg that the female laid actually was uh, low in volume, low in hormone content. So she actually based on who the father was uh, change the characteristics of the egg, giving that offspring a, a much lower chance at being uh, having a large amount of biological fitness. So extremely interesting. And uh, if he's if she's got good genes to work with, she'll give it a little more effort. It's basically the bottom line. And I think I think that's pretty. If, if you know that you've got a good you you've got a great partner, you've got you know you've got someone who's going to work with you. You've got somebody who is going to be giving you good good genes. <laughs> you're going to put in a lot of effort. <laughs> well, indeed, although, but then you would have to liken that to the human condition of, you know, a lot of humans uh, give foster care and adopt yeah. children who are bi biologically related at all. Um, and so we, I mean, and I'm glad that we are <laughs> outside of the survive and reproduce rules on this one. Um, you know, we tend to have a lot more compassion and a lot more of the nurture than the nature in, in, some, res in some respects. Right. I know in um, in some primates, they um, that that adult females will take on the orphan children yes. of, of yep. other females. So if a female dies for whatever reason, that their child their child will not just die. That they will Indeed. they will take them on. Um, what about babysitting? Is that something? I mean, there's the wet nurse, but that's not mm -hmm. quite. That, that's kind of like babysitting, I guess. Well, I guess there, this is another tough one. I mean, when times are tough, parents have to go to work. Uh, and I, in my book, I actually write this about my neighbor and I who had our baby daughters at the same time. And a year later, she had to go back to work. And so her daughter went into full-time daycare and it was tough. I didn't see them anymore. And I, you know, this poor little gal was in the daycare. I'm sure she, she was very well taken care of, but at the same time, she was without her mom. Well, times are tough in the animal kingdom as well, uh, especially when during times of uh, El Nino or other climatic events, for example, that might make resources more scarce. And this is the situation that was looked at in a number of Galapagos birds uh, during an El Nino event when it was found that parents had to spend a lot of time away from the nest. Generally speaking, when parents have to spend just a little time away, there's a, there's a form of, of allo parenting that takes place. Other parents around will lend some form of care to the children that are left alone in the nest. And this could be, you know, in exchange for some, some allo preening or some grooming later on. Um, but generally speaking, when times aren't too bad, Children are, are well taken care of, but when times are tough, everybody is looking to take care of their own. And unfortunately, when two parents are gone from the nest, it's not a good situation for the little for the little babies that are left behind. And uh, what what ends up happening is a lot of times uh, in the nest when these when these juveniles are alone, neighboring birds, neighboring adults will actually attack them and uh, induce mortality a lot of the time. 
or they will leave them openly wounded for other organisms to come and prey on. And uh, so unfortunately, these non-parental visits, as they were called, uh, result in a, a greater amount of mortality for these for these chicks. And mm -hmm. this is just because the mom and dad are spending so much time away from the nest. And this is obviously a case where everybody is starving. And so what they want to do is they want to avoid feeding accidentally feeding another orphan who's around and they they kind of get around this problem by attacking them and uh and most often killing them as well yikes tough tough yeah the animal makes world you want to get is, that nanny cam <laughs> yeah the animal world is a tough place and oh, it, is. it yes. is i think that uh you know there are from 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 what i've read and you know studied and, and other things it, yeah, the human kingdom, the human, the human condition, you know, we, we are not that far off from the animal kingdom. You know, we are a part of it. We have, we derive so many of our behaviors and what we do from the, the same basic needs and from, you know, eons of evolutionary uh, history. And yeah, it just, it just, it just seems that the more we look at it, just the more similarities, more commonalities, and the less reason we have to think of ourselves as anything less than an animal as well. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I completely agree. That's the same, I, I think that's in general, the same conclusion that I came to. I think that we as humans have it pretty darn good. There's a lot that we have been able to manipulate. For example, it's very easy for me to get all the food that I need at my supermarket. It's already clean, it's already detoxified. Um, I don't need to worry about getting attacked by a predator on my way to the grocery store. I don't need to worry about somebody breaking into my house because I have doors, locks on the doors. I have a partner already. I have children and actually something that we humans do that's very strange, but we're done having kids now. And we are actively trying not to have any more children, which is totally anti-biology, but it's comfortable. And so, yeah, I think that we humans do a lot of things that are unnatural, but over overall, we are certainly looking to survive and reproduce just like everyone else. That seems like a great note to end this program on. We are we have reached the end of our hour, um, and I thank you so much for coming and onto the wow, show today. Thank you too. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been really great, really fun. I love, you know, it's 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 really important to put ourselves next to the animals that we live with in the world, and I think it's just great to learn about all the crazy things that we do and all the crazy <laughs> things that animals do. Oh yeah. Indeed. Biology is cool. <laughs> it is. Biology is very cool. And if anybody is interested in um, more of Karen Bondar's work and getting, uh, looking into her book, you can find information at Karen Bondar, C A R I N B O N D A R dot com. And I would put up the web page right now, but for some reason, the internet stopped working on this particular computer. <laughs> Halfway through the show, it just decided to not work anymore. What can a person Excellent. do? So C A R I N B O N D A R dot com is the website. Uh, it's a she Karen blogs there regularly. She does a, what do you, you do a you do a research paper a week that you that you write about? Well, I, I do. I try to do uh, write a review of a paper as yeah. often as I can. I put up cool biology jobs. I interview biology professors. That's just a really cool mess of biological cool stuff. So yeah, check it out. Yeah. And if you would also like to follow Karen on Twitter, she has a Twitter account at Dr. Bondar, D-R-B-O-N-D-A-R. And you can find her on Twitter, which we all know and love. She has some great tidbits up there and good conversations in 140 characters or less. It's wonderful. So once again, thank you very much, Karen. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Everyone thank out you so there, much. you're welcome. Thank you so much for watching this hour or listening. If you're listening to the podcast, do appreciate it. Uh, you can you can catch us next week, Dr. Kiki Science Hour. We'll be back next Thursday talking about more science, which we love to do. You can follow my sciencey pursuits on Twitter at Dr. Kiki. Uh, at Dr. T Dr. Kiki TV is my website, or you can catch my Facebook fan page if you want to.
follow what I'm doing there. You can also subscribe if you haven't yet. We do love subscribers to Dr. Kiki Science Hour in iTunes um, or at the Twit website. You can find past episodes at twit.tv forward slash Kiki, K-I-K-I. Also, if you need more sciencey goodness, you can also listen to This Week in Science, which airs this evening, Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. live on the Twit Network. Um, or you can download it. You can go to twist.org for more information there. I'll see you next week. And thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for listening to Karen. And I hope you check out her book, The Nature of Human Nature. <laughs> it's a great read and some fun cartoons in there. It's just a, a great, um, it's an enjoyable romp through humanity. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So remember, all I ask is one hour per week. And uh, one hour is that, not that much when you really turn around and look and say, hey, this week my world got a lot more interesting. So thanks a lot. <laughs>